Pew Bibles, it's 264 and 265 pages. The title of this section says, Famine in a Besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. The siege lifted. Now, there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Armenians and surrender. Sorry, Aramaeans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Aramaeans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there, for the Lord had caused the Aramaeans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. Thanks, Brenda. Those of you who watch TV uh, a little bit may uh, be familiar with uh, a series of Snicker bar commercials that go under the, the uh, that finish with the slogan "You're not you when you're hungry," and they're kind of they're kind of humorous. Maybe you've seen uh, a few of them. Here's an example of one. Go ahead and play that, Jim. Can we turn the AC up? I'm dying back here. It's on. Can't you feel it? Can you feel that? Oh. <laughs> Jeff, eat a Snickers, please. Why? Every time you get hungry, you turn into a diva. Just eat it so Ooh. we can all coexist. Turn into a diva. Mm -hmm. Then your sister will break your pants. Okay. Thank you. Better? Better. Will you get your knees out of the back of my seat? Oh. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. Zip it. <laughs> Are you hungry now for Snickers bar? Yep, this sermon brought to you by Snickers. Uh, you know, this is the beginning of Christmas season, and, you know, honestly, pastors, we get stressed out by Christmas because we, we come back to a story that uh, we've preached on probably like a hundred times. <laughs> And we feel this stress to go to this old story that we're all so familiar with and try to find something new we haven't seen before or heard before. And, and sometimes uh, those of us that, that, that preach this time of year feel that stress. How, stress. How am I going to get something new out of this story? But the truth is what you and I usually need is not a brand new teaching, is it? Uh, in fact, something that's brand new probably isn't true. What we need are not brand new insights or brand new truths. What we need are reminders of the greatness of old truths. That's what we need. And that's primarily, I think, why we gather together on Sundays. Not for you to discover something you've never, ever heard before, but for you to be reminded of something that maybe you've known but have forgotten to be reminded about the greatness of old truths. So the most important task of a Christian isn't, 
isn't uh, first to learn something new, but to remember uh, what you already know. Uh, the task of a Christian isn't to become somebody else, it's to remember, first of all, who you already are. So the, the, the greatest enemy for you and I is forgetfulness. That we would forget what we already know, and that we would forget who we already are. Uh, and, and this is why Peter writes this letter. We, we, we call it Second Peter. He says in 2 Peter um, a number of times, he, he says something like this. This is chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, um, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this body. And then he goes on to say a chapter later, he says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Or, or uh, your Bible might say, I have written these as a way of stirring you up so that you may be reminded uh, to awaken you, to snap you out of your forgetfulness. So all that to say, Advent, when, when we kind of come back to this old story again, uh, is, is kind of like a Snickers bar for us. It serves to remind us who we are, to remind us of what we, we already have known, but maybe we have forgotten, or we're not being mindful of Advent, this time of year, awakens us to the power of these old truths. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be doing over these next couple of Sundays. You're probably not going to hear anything new. Sorry, that's why you came. But you're going to be reminded of, of the greatness of old truths and the important, port, importance of things you've already heard, but maybe have forgotten. Uh, Advent, what does the word Advent mean? Anybody know? There, there's a quarter for anybody. What's that? Well, that was quick. Ruth, you are quick. Oh, you caught it. <laughs> Woo! Girls can catch. Okay. So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Advent means uh, coming, or uh, uh, it, it, it's, the, it's the Latin word Adventus, which means arrival, the arrival, the coming. Uh, and so, of course, associated with Christmas, it's a time where we remember, we ponder again, the coming, the arrival of Jesus Christ into this world. The question then, the important question is why? Why the coming? Why the arrival of Jesus? And we're going to take a few minutes to, to discuss the answer that Jesus gives, or one of the answers that Jesus gives, because throughout the Gospels, he gives us an answer to that question. And you can, there, there's a few different ways of answering the question why. Why the coming? He answers that question, uh, we find it in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It's, it's at the end of that story of Zacchaeus. At the end of that story, uh, Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You've heard that before, haven't you? Most of you. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There it is, one sentence. I just want to take some time to unpack that, look at a few of those words there, and just ponder that in a, in a fresh way. The Son of Man, of course, Jesus is referring to himself there, he being the Son of Man. And that was an Old Testament title uh, for, for uh, the coming Messiah. One of those titles was the Son of Man. And Jesus accepts that title for himself as the Messiah. He says this in John chapter 3, verse 13. He says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. That is the Son of Man being himself. So the Son of Man is a term that suggests uh, or, or that represents the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The heavenly origin. That he's not from here, that he's come from heaven to this place as the Son of Man speaks of his heavenly origin. The creator entered creation. Paul puts it this way uh, in 
Philippians chapter 2. He says, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or clung to. Rather, he uh, made himself nothing. Or your version might say he emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. The creator, the one of all power, of all glory, that one who is worshipped by all the heavenly beings from the time of creation, who's attributed all glory and all honor, that being, that one, leaves that place and comes and empties himself in the form of a little baby boy named Jesus. Born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger. Uh, I don't know the name of that TV show. I don't think I've ever watched it. But there's a show about bosses who switch place for their employees. Anyone don't remember the name of that show? Undercover. Undercover Boss? Undercover Boss, right? Okay, you, you watch that, Ty? Okay. So... The, 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 whole, the whole point is, is the CEO, right, or, 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 or the big shot, the guy who calls the shots, the guy who makes all the money, he comes, you know, the CEO of McDonald's, he comes and he takes the place of that um, pimply teenager that would normally be working at the till or flipping the burgers, and he spends a day or a period of time doing that work. And, and you know, seeing what it's like to be the person that gets abused by the customers, Right? That, that works in this hot, sweaty kitchen for next to no pay. And I suppose it's kind of an entertaining show, but, but, but what we have here is the ultimate undercover boss. Right? Think of it from heaven's perspective. Think of it from an angelic perspective. This one who, who uh, is, is, is worthy of all this glory that he's getting leaves that place, leaves his throne, lays down his crown, and goes, comes. And he isn't born into a palace. He's born into probably a a lower than middle class family, laid in a manger of hay around the smell of donkey manure. Growing up as just, as, as an average boy, walking the dusty streets, accepting all human frailty, all of that, and ultimately accepting the cross. Uh, Can you imagine what that would have looked like from heaven's perspective? No! He's leaving to go there? You're sending him into the world? To that place? But the Son of Man came. Why? Jesus says the Son of Man came to seek, first of all, to seek the lost. Now, the word seek uh, implies at least two things. The word seek implies intent, okay? Seeking is not something you do by accident. You seek because you're intentionally seeking. Uh, Jesus wasn't surprised to find himself in a manger. Like, what am I doing here? Who are these people? You know, what am I doing in this? Hey, why am I, in, I, I, I'm in the body of an, in- it's not a surprise that he's there. He's, by, he's there by intent. Because you don't seek by accident, right? It's a choice, and it's a choice that involves great effort and perseverance. That's when you use that word seek, when it involves great effort. Like when Rusty's sitting on the couch with his feet up, I don't say, when my wife says, what are you doing? I don't say, I'm seeking ESPN, right? I'm seeking. You go, I get what you're saying, but that's probably not the right word for looking for the ESPN channel. There's other words for that. Seek is probably not the word for that because seek has a different idea. It's something that involves getting off the couch, going. It's something that involves great effort and great perseverance. And, and, and Jesus gives us a few little illustrations to show us what seeking looks like. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, I believe, he talks about uh, a, 
A, a woman who has lost a gold coin, a valuable coin. She, 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 hadn't, she, she doesn't know where it is. And what does she do? She seeks. She goes and she turns that house upside down. She flips every cushion in the couch. She probably puts her arm way down there where all you're going to find is like half-eaten moldy apples and other things, trying to find the gold coin. And finally she finds the gold coin and then she rejoices and throws a party. And he said, seeking is also like the shepherd who loses the sheep. He's got a hundred sheep, but one gets lost. And he leaves the 99. And he goes out to all the places, to the dangerous places, to the thickets, to the edge of cliffs, to find the sheep. He seeks it out. Great effort, great perseverance. And he finds the sheep, and when he does, he rejoices. That's seeking. It's a choice you make that involves great effort and great perseverance. Jesus seeks, came to seek the lost. So seek communicates intent. It also implies initiative. Initiative. It's not a response. When you seek something, it's, here, it, it's not a response. This, this is not about answering. This is about asking. Uh, G Jesus isn't just like a, a, a really friendly, generous neighbor. Do you have good neighbors? I've got great neighbors. I've got great neighbors. I've learned that Rusty doesn't need to invest in a snowblower because Rusty has great neighbors. <laughs> and I've also learned if I don't shovel it by 9 a.m., one of them comes over and does it for me. I don't use that to my advantage. Please don't tell Len that, that that's... Because he's one of those guys, he's one of those great... But I have a next-door neighbor, I'm not going to give you his name, but he is a great neighbor. This guy will give you anything you need. You ask for it, he will give it to you, right? And, and a good neighbor is someone you can go over at any hour of the day and you can knock and say, I'm in the middle of baking this, we just discovered we have no flour, we, can, I, can I borrow a cup of flour? And a good neighbor says, sure you can! What do you need? Yeah, okay, here's a cup of flour. You don't got to pay it back, don't worry for me. That's what I do for my neighbor. My neighbor, he, he's so good, he has this nice, I don't know if it's a 1965 Mustang convertible. He polishes it a lot. It's really nice. And, and I, I suspect that if I went and asked for that, he'd give it to me. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, but but because Rusty doesn't know how to drive stick, because Rusty's, <laughs> Rusty's not a man. But um, he, he, he's, he's a really good neighbor. You ask for it, he will give it. Jesus is, that's not what seeking is, okay? Jesus isn't a really good neighbor. Um, Jesus initiates. He doesn't just respond. He doesn't just answer your question. He just doesn't give what you need. He initiates. And, and so th this statement of his, the son of uh, man came to seek and to save the lost. Again, that's at the end of the story of Zacchaeus. Some of you know the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus was coming into that town. Zacchaeus is the wee little man who climbs up into the tree so he can get a, he's from a good vantage point to see Jesus. And Jesus comes into town and Zacchaeus says, Jesus, Jesus. I've got supper ready. Would you come to my house? And Jesus said, sure. I'd love to come to your house, Zacchaeus. Absolutely. I'll put whatever my plans are, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to break those plans and I'm going to come and I'm going to I'm, I'm accept your invitation. Is that how the story went? It, did, it doesn't go that way. Zacchaeus is in the tree and Jesus comes and he looks at the man and he says, I must come to your house. Come down from here at once. You might even call him a rude neighbor. I, 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 has anyone said that to you? Liz, I must come to your house for supper today. Prepare, prepare the fatted calf. <laughs> this is important. This is what seeking is. Seeking is not responding to a knock. It's not answering a question. It's initiating. It's going out. It's asking the question. It's knocking on somebody else's door. 
And so Jesus initiates, and you see this determination. He doesn't say, I'm gonna, I want to, can I? He says, I must stay at your house. Jesus' coming was not a response to our invitation. There was nobody saying, Lord, we're dying down here. If you could just, in your mercy and grace, send your son into the world, die on the cross for our sins, so that we could, so that, you know, we, we could experience, experience peace with you, have eternal life, that would be great because we can't do it on our own. That's not what happened. It says it a different way in the New Testament, a few different ways, but in Colossians it says, while we were enemies of God, while we were enemies of God, he sent his son into the world. This is not a, this is not a God who's responding. This is a God who's initiating This is what it means to seek. So, so, so Jesus came to seek the lost and he says to save the lost. So the purpose of his seeking, the purpose of all that effort, the purpose of all that perseverance, all that cost to leave heaven to come to earth was saving. It says it this way in John 3, 17. God, right after that verse, John 3, 16, right? You know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? That whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. The very next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Not to condemn, but to save the world through him. Because you know what, some people can go to, 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 to great length to seek somebody out just to slap them in the face. Anger can motivate you to do that. There's two emotions that will cause you to seek with great effort and perseverance, love and anger. It's not a given that Jesus comes into the world to seek in order to save. He could come into the world to seek in order to condemn. But he comes to seek. He, he could have been like that rescue chopper, right? The guys, the, the idiot left the trail. Even though there were signs posted saying, don't leave the trail. He left the trail and now he's lost out in the bush for days and days. And, and that rescue copter could come and, 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 and lower that, that rescuer after they find him wandering in the woods, and he could say, hey, idiot! You shouldn't have left the trail! You've really made a mess of it for yourself, haven't you? See ya. Hope you find your way out. All right, take me up, take me up. We're out of here. Okay. Jesus didn't seek us to condemn the world. He came to seek to save those who were lost. He didn't seek out Zacchaeus, okay, to set him straight. Because if you know the story, you know Zacchaeus had a reputation. Not a good one. This was a, this was a bad man. This was an evil man. This was a thief. This was a fraud. Nobody liked this man. They had lots of bad names for him. And Jesus doesn't say, I must come to your house. And then he doesn't go to the house and he doesn't just rip into the man. Zacchaeus, you snake. How dare you do what you've done? In sight of God, who do you think you are? God's judgment is going to come on you, Zacchaeus. That's not why he sought Zacchaeus out, just to set him straight. He didn't go to preach judgment, but to, but, but, but to, to preach repentance and forgiveness to him. And, and he refers to Zacchaeus as lost. And he refers to us, he, re, he refers to, to humanity as lost. That's not the, the way others describe Zacchaeus. Nobody had ever said, called Zacchaeus lost. They called him all sorts of other names, but no one had ever, ever said, you know that lost guy? I'm pretty sure Jesus is the first one to call Zacchaeus lost. Others viewed Zacchaeus as being the problem. Jesus viewed him as having a problem. J 
Jesus viewed Zacchaeus as having a problem, not being a problem. Okay? Because viewing somebody as being a problem produces a seeking and a condemning. Viewing somebody as having a problem produces seeking and saving. So at Christmas, we're, we're reminded that Jesus came to seek and to save us when we were lost. And so we're reminded of that. Any praise Jesus's? Any thank you, Lords, that you sought and you saved when I was lost? As Wanda was talking about, how my life was a wreck. I was trying and trying and not succeeding. And then I realized I didn't have to try and try because Jesus has done it for me and all I have to do is, is trust in him. Because he sought me, I, I didn't pursue him. He pursued me. His pursuit was the first pursuit. So that should cause us to go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you that I was lost and now I'm found. Thank you for all these blessings. But that's not all we, we need to be reminded of as we hear that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, we also have to remember the words of Jesus that he shares in John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Okay? Just, just to wake anybody up. If anybody, I'm going to say the first part. You're going to say the second part, all right? As the Father has sent me, a okay, bit of a delayed response. Okay, well, we'll try to get in unison here. Now that you know it, what you say is, so send I you. As the Father has sent me. So teachable. Right? Do you hear that? Sometimes you have to hear things more than once. Sometimes you have to say them. As the Father has sent me, so. Oh, you're doing it again. Okay, that's. <laughs> you're so good. Yeah. Jesus says, hey, listen. As I came to seek and to save the lost, and I found you, and I saved you. Just as he sent me, just as I came, I'm sending you, and you go to seek and to save the lost. Just as the Father sent me, so exactly like that, I'm sending you. This story that Brenda read Weird. I mean, this is why you should read the Old Testament. Anybody who says the Old Testament, the Bible's boring, can you turn to 2 Kings 6 and 7? There's some crazy stuff that happens there. I even cut some of it out because you might not eat your lunch if we read the whole story because there's people eating people and it ain't pretty, right? The story begins that Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom called Israel, Samaria has been besieged by the enemy arm, army, the Arameans, and besieged means we don't actually go in and kill you. We just, we just starve you out. We just surround the city so that nothing goes in and nothing comes out until you run out of food, until you starve and either surrender or die. And so this is the predicament that the city of Samaria was in. And it was so desperate that, that what li they were eating donkey heads. And a donkey head was like, you had to pay two pounds of silver for a donkey head? I don't, need, I don't think I'd eat a donkey head if you gave me two pounds of silver. Um, there's these four lepers. Now, lepers, they didn't live in the city walls because lepers are lepers. They're outcasts. They're diseased. So they live in a little leper camp right outside the city walls. But they're surrounded by this army too. They're in the same predicament. And these four lepers go, oh my goodness, our position here is bad. Really, they thought about it, we really only have three options. Either we, we go into the city as lepers and maybe they kill us. Or we just wait it out here and we just die from starvation. Or maybe we could wander into the Aramean camp. And maybe by some act of God's mercy, they might have mercy on us and let us survive and not kill us. They said, either, they, they concluded that was the best option, right? Of, of three really bad options, that was the best option. So they left their little leper camp, and they wandered towards the camp of the Arameans. And when they got there, they found that the place had been deserted. Like the steam was still coming off the roast turkeys. The wine was still in the goblets. 
These people just left in a hurry. It goes on to say that their armor is just screwed. Like, it's like they're running and stripping off their armor as they're going. Why? Because God sent the sound of a great army into their camp. It was four lepers just over the brow of the hill. <laughs> but God sends this great army, and they think the Egyptian army has come and is going to rout them. And they take off and they leave everything right there. And this is what these four lepers stumble onto. Can you imagine? It's almost like it was Christmas. And there it is, the food, the wealth. And what do they do? They start gorging mashed potatoes, stuffing. They start gorging. They start collecting gold, silver, you know, all the fine, you know, all the valuable stuff. They go off someplace, they dig a hole, and they hide it. They go back a second time, eat some more, gather some more valuables. They go and they hide it, and they're, they're storing up for themselves. And what are you thinking as you hear this story? You're thinking, when is it going to dawn on them that there's a city full of people that are starving, right? When is it going to dawn on them? Because it's so obvious to us in this story. Maybe they thought, nah. They treated us like lepers. They, they kicked us out of the city. We were the outcasts. Forget them. Uh, but finally, we find that they come to their senses. And after a few trips of hoarding all this wealth and filling their bellies, they, say, they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. What we're doing is not right. Okay, it was so obvious to us, they finally came to their senses. What, what, what they're doing is not right. But then they go on and say, this is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. This is a day of good news. Where have you heard that before? Where have you heard that before? Right? I'm trying to pull a song with it in it, but I'm not finding any. What's that? Sure, right? To those shepherds, the angel appears. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people for today in the city of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. They come and say, today, shepherds, is a day of good news. This is one of the first times here in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Kings 7 that we get this term, good news. They say, this is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to our, ourselves. And the angel comes and says, this is a day of good news, of great joy for you. Great joy for all people. It's good news for all people, because there's a Savior for you now that's been provided. And we who, who know that, we who have believed in Jesus and put our trust in Jesus, we have experienced this great hoard of wealth, this great treasure in our life. Right? This great, just, just as those lepers stund, stumbled into that camp, so we have stumbled into this great camp full of all these treasures, all of this wealth that's just given to us. And it tastes good. And it feels good. And I can't help but wonder if all of heaven, all of the angelic hosts look down on us and ask, I wonder when it's going to strike them. It's so obvious to us. I wonder when it's going to hit them. When are they going to go back to... to, to Tell the others. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. For some reason, that's, that's not always so obvious to us, is it? You know, our tendency is to allow ourselves to become so absorbed in what God is doing for us, so absorbed in the treasure, so absorbed in the feast, um, that we forget that we have this great responsibility to go back to the city of starvation, to the place of famine, 
and shared the good news. We have this great responsibility, right? To whom much is given, much is required. And this, especially for those of us who, 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 are, who have been Christians longer than others, uh, we're the worst at this, I think. Because we have enjoyed the treasure for so long, it's been easy to forget about the city of famine. The longer you're a Christian, the more prone you are to let this happen. To forget, to just so, be so absorbed in all the, in, in all the, the Bible studies and the Christian fellowship and all the good things. And to forget that as Jesus was sent, so we are sent. I mean, this, for, especially for me, now I'm preaching to myself as much as you. This title, my, the title of the sermon might as well be For Rusty, right? Because this, this is even tricky for those who are professionally Christian. When your whole circle can be within the realm of the feast, within the realm of the Aramean camp, and you can live your whole life in the Aramean camp. Our call is to seek the lost and to share the good news of God's salvation that's a call for all of us. It wasn't for the 12 disciples. It's not for the especially gifted. This was for all who would follow Jesus. As I've been sent, so I am sending you. And that means, A, it means seeing people as lost. It means seeing Zacchaeus as lost. Do you view people as lost? Do you view people as having a problem or do you view people as being a problem? It means taking initiative. Jesus, just as Jesus sought, he took initiative. So we are to take initiative. You know, I, th I think this is so important because this is where we, we uh, make a mistake. You know, your faith is not a private affair. We too often have made it, uh, you know, our, 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 our faith something, something private. And that's not what it is. But we say to ourselves, if someone comes to me and asks, if someone knocks on my door and asks for a cup of flour, hey, I'd gladly give a cup of flour. I'm not going to hide anything. If someone comes and asks, I ain't going to hide, I ain't going to shy away. That's not what it means to seek. To say, I'll be ready. I'll be ready when my neighbor comes knocking on my door. That's not seeking. Just as Jesus went, so we are called to go. Not to receive, to go. And fortunately for us, others didn't keep their faith private, right? Those first disciples didn't keep it private. Those to whom we have received the faith didn't keep it private. They went. And they sought. And so we're called just as Jesus took initiative, so we are to take initiative and just as Jesus was willing to pay the price, so too we must be willing to pay the price. It was costly for Jesus, wasn't it? I mean, there was cost for him. He had to lay something aside, something good. Something that was his by right. He had to, lay, he, he, he had to choose to lay that aside and to go and become a person and to become weak and frail and to, you know, accept all of that and to die on the cross. I mean, there was a great cost for him. It's no less for us. There is cost for us. Are we willing to pay that price? I, I, I read a story of a, of a grocer, a grocery store owner in England. His name was Sohan Singh. Um, he got really uh, annoyed with the bad manners of his customers. First, he banned smoking. Then he banned crude language. Finally, he banned baby strollers. Then he banned pets. And finally, he banned the customers themselves. <laughs> this is true. So shoppers must now go uh, look through the window to spot the items they want and then ring a bell to be served through a small hatch in the door. He says, I have lost business, but I cannot say how much. I am a man of principles and I stand by my decision. Hmm. It seems to me that a grocer who bans customers from his store has lost sight of his purpose. Just like that grocer, many churches, many Christians have forgotten their Savior's purpose to seek and to save those who are lost. Right? To put up. 
to, 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 can you imagine for those, those lepers to leave that treasure, to go back to that place? To go back to the stink? To go back to the filth? To go back to all of that? All the memories? But they said, this is a day of good news. We cannot keep this to ourselves. We dare not keep this to ourselves. And for us, that might mean, you know, that might mean putting up with stuff. It might mean putting ourselves in uncomfortable places. It, mean, it certainly means leaving the treasure and going back to the city. It certainly means paying the price of investing in, in relationships. And every investment involves cost. So let, let me read this quote um, as, as I wrap up here. Um, I just found this this morning. You can ask why later, but Annika Googled Charles Spurgeon this morning. A great, yeah, you know him, right? Charles Spurgeon, great Baptist preacher of London in the 1800s. And um, she Googled him to see a picture of him. He's got a beard much like mine, very full, big, manly. And beside the picture of his face was this quote I saw this morning. And so I jotted it down and said, yeah, this is... It's, it's kind of that, that sort of uh, old-fashioned way of speaking, but, but this is it. This is it. He says, Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them, uh, at, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. Will you carve out, will we carve out the time to leave the treasure and go back? The treasure's awesome. That Aramean camp, it's great. Will you carve out the time to leave that and go out and go back? What would that look like in your life? Who would you make time with to invite to lunch? Who would you call just to catch up and see how they're doing? Who would you invite into your home to have dinner with you and your family? Who would you invite to church, to a gathering? of the church. I don't want you to identify yourselves, but how many, how many of you have invited someone to church in the last year? And if not, why not? If not, is it because you don't know anybody outside of the Aramean camp? It's just you and the lepers? I mean, that's a question for me. Who would I ask? In what relationship have I invested in that I would ask? Who would you invite to church? Don't belittle the power of small invitations. Who would you begin to pray for tenaciously? What would it look like in your time to, to carve out the time to leave the treasure and go back? Our relationships, and this came from the chapter us men looked at uh, this last Tuesday. Uh, our, our relationships, all of our relationships, all of our encounters with people, big and small, are not social accidents, but are divine appointments by a sovereign God. Is that how you view them? All of our relationships are not social accidents. They are divine appointments by a sovereign God. You know the promise to Abraham? We've just finished going through the life of Abraham over the last few months. Do you remember the promise to Abraham? When God gave him the call? I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And through your offspring, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. Remember that? And we asked, who is that offspring of Abraham? through whom all the peoples of the earth will be blessed? And the first answer is it's Jesus, because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, all people. But it's not just Jesus, because Paul says, you who have faith in him are descendants of Abraham. 
Who is the offspring through which God intends to bless all the peoples of the world? It's through you, us. We are the offspring of Abraham. It is through us that God intends to uh, bless all the peoples of the earth. On that day 2,000 years ago when, when the good uh, news of the coming of the Savior was first shared by the angels to the shepherds, it tells us what? They went and they found him lying in a manger and then they spread the word. They worshipped. They bowed down. They were filled with awe. And then they spread the word. Like that day, today is a day of good news. Do you believe that? Like that day, today is a day of good news. So the question for us is, what will we do with it? Lord, we thank you that you sent your son into the world to seek and to save us while we were lost. While we were just going about our life, enemies of God in our mind, not pursuing you, not caring, you cared for us and you loved us. And your son came and he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant and he even died on the cross for us so that in finding us, we might be saved. We thank you, Father, those of us who have have heard that, who have believed in that, who have received that. We thank you, Father. We praise you. Thank you for that great feast of which, that place we dwell. Um, But Lord, uh, you call us to go out as those who have been found. You call us to go out because today is a day of good news and it is not right to keep it to ourselves. So, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just show each one of us individually as families, as a church here, Father, what, would, what it would look like for us to say, today is a day of good news. We cannot keep this to ourselves. Use us, Father. Use our seeking to find the lost for the glory of your name. Amen.